defense of Pedrag Rajic, and uh, um, we are pleased to, well, thanks for coming. The crowd is still filing in, and thanks for uh, Pedrag's family for coming uh, to join him in this, uh, this event. Um, uh, we have uh, up on the screen here uh, Dr. Peter Butke, who is from uh, George Mason University, and he is the external examiner today. And on behalf of the University of Guelph, Dr. Becky, I'd like to uh, extend our appreciation for your efforts uh, today. Um, Glenn, or Gaytu Halu is the internal external, and uh, John uh, Cranfield is on the supervisor committee, and Pedrag's supervisor is Glenn Fox. So the exam will proceed in the normal fashion. Pedrag will give a presentation. We'll open it up to questions from the audience, and then we will have two rounds of questions. Uh, beginning with Dr. Becky and then Gaytu, John, and, and Glenn. <coughs> Feel free to leave at any time. Uh, we'll probably take a bit of a break after the first round, but we'll see how you're doing and whether you're still standing or not and, uh, and shaky. Um, so, Pedrag, take her away. Can you, can you do me, before we get started, can you tell your tech guy he switched the things again? So now I have like a, all I see is the, the PowerPoint front page rather than the picture of the speaker. There we go. Okay, good. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's a great uh, privilege to have an opportunity to present some of my uh, research today. I would like to thank my advisory committee for their guidance and, and their support throughout this project. I would also like to thank my family for providing the human infrastructure necessary for this uh, project to materialize. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Betke for agreeing to be the external examiner. The title of today's presentation is Linking Comparative Advantage, Supply Management and uh, Environmental Externalities, uh, lesson, Lessons from an Integrative uh, Economic Approach. And, uh, let me start with uh, let me start with the uh, economic problem that uh, motivated uh, this research. Uh, the Canadian Farm Product Agencies Act stipulates that comparative advantage will be one of the guiding principles for allocation of um, production quota uh, among provinces in supply managed industries. Now I should first say something about what supply management is and what uh, uh, production or overbase quota are. So supply management is basically allocation of production uh, through a system of a, a limited quantity of permits uh, issued by a central agency. And overbase quota is a yearly increase in the national production level. Um, so only recently economists have tried to tackle this issue and give some advice to the uh, people that are in charge of uh, this allocation uh, to, uh, to in incorporate this principle in, in uh, provincial allocations, but they gave sort of conflicting recommendations. Some of these conflicting recommendations in the context of the egg industry include Doyon, uh, who suggested multiple indicators of comparative advantage, uh, but according to Milky, they are mostly inappropriate. Uh, now Milky suggests quota prices but uh, doesn't spell out uh, the theoretical underpinnings or the implementation method for using quota prices. Uh, LaRue and Gervais suggest uh, an indicator called domestic resource cost coefficient, while Katz et al. suggest revealed out of advantage. These different indicators um, often give different results, and uh, since there's no clear consensus on which one is the most appropriate, I found that uh, part of my role here is to bring the debate a little bit closer to uh, some sort of a resolution on this. Uh, in the dairy industry case, uh, within provinces, quota is allocated through a system of quota exchange 
or quota markets, uh, while overbase quota, which is the additional uh, increase in provincial allocations, is determined by the, uh, by the Canadian Milk Supply Management Committee, that's the central uh, federal body that, uh, that makes these decisions, and it says it's determined by negotiation between provincial representatives to a consensus where every province has one representative. Uh, the details of this process are not really provided, so this is what we can uh, uh, say. <coughs> Now, to, before we say anything about uh, deeper theoretical um, issues, we should say something about comparative advantage. So, what is it? It's, a, it's an economic concept used to explain specialization and exchange, where, as a consequence of special, specialization and exchange, we have an increase in total uh, productivity. It is based on differences in relative product productivities uh, among uh, economic agents. Uh, we can frame uh, d decisions revolving around comparative advantage in sort of two ways. For example, we could say, uh, in the context of dairy production, should I be a dairy farmer or should I be something else? Should I specialize in dairy production or something else? In, uh, in some uh, aggregate sense, we could say, should province X produce more milk? or more something else instead. So these are sorts of decisions that are made around uh, this concept. And as everything else, it may change over time. And uh, one of the ways it could change over time, we found recently, is something that we could call environmental comparative advantage. And this is a graph I took from a study we did a few years ago, a couple years ago. Uh, and what this graph does, it compares uh, different countries in terms of what we could call uh, environmental intensity of agriculture. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we, we have total fertilizer use per hectare of agricultural land. And on the vertical axis, we have livestock units, basically measuring number of uh, livestock uh, per square kilometer of agricultural land. So, we would see, we would say for countries that are further out from the origin that they are more environmental, environmental intensive or that environmental externalities are potentially higher there. So we could say, for example, that Canada, which is here, uh, pretty low, as most of these countries in this uh, rectangle are the rest of European countries, United States uh, also, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, but we could say that Canada uh, is, uh, has an environmental competitive advantage compared to, say, Netherlands, because uh, it has lower environmental intensity. Basically, uh, we could say that uh, if Canadian farmers have to comply with, a, with the same standards as, as Netherlands farmers, they're likely to do it. It, it is likely for them to be easier compared to uh, Netherlands. Now, when we talk about changes in comparative advantage, uh, we mainly uh, observe those changes as uh, changes in spatial allocation of production. Uh, this graph shows percentage shares uh, of 50 top counties uh, by dairy population, dairy cow population uh, in Ontario. So it ranges from about 9% uh, to, if you follow the line, uh, it's uh, ordered in a decreasing order uh, to about between 2 and 3 percent. Now, what this graph shows is the distribution or percentage of shares in 1991 for these 15 counties. And if we uh, looked at, say, 2006, and uh, if these percentage shares or the spatial distribution within Ontario didn't change, we would expect to see the same line in 2006, everybody, all counties have the same percentage shares. So let's take a look at what happened between 1991 and 2006. So what happened is the blue line. So we see the production shifted into some counties out of some other counties. So changes are happening in spatial allocation of dairy production within Ontario. And we can see similar changes 
in other provinces. Now, if we do that at the national level, and these are now provinces, so these are percentage shares of different provinces in the national uh, dairy cow population in 93, and compare it to 2006, <coughs> we see almost no change. So things are sort of static in terms of percent shares of production. Now, if we summarize this, we see changes within provinces and no changes across provinces. And if you remember that uh, allocation of water within provinces is guided by a system of water exchange, and this is guided by a system of decision by the central authority, we may, uh, we may want to think about whether these two, uh, these differences have something to do with that. Now, some, some research questions that we uh, may start thinking about here is, for example, could we explain some of these changes within provinces in terms of uh, uh, shifts in production? Uh, another kind of questions that we could ask is, can we figure out how these uh, provincial uh, allocations, uh, whether they're masked by the, by the system, uh, supply management system, would they, would they be different in some, uh, some uh, other system of freer exchange? Uh, and so just to summarize, we could summarize some research questions. Uh, the first would be, uh, did environmental externalities and policy have a role in the changes in dairy location within provinces? Now, uh, now, the next question could be, how to measure or observe potential changes in comparative advantage at the provincial level, potentially masked by supply management system? And third would be, how to incorporate these changes into provincial overbase quota allocations, which is the initial problem that we were given uh, by the law. So I address these uh, questions in five chapters uh, in the thesis. Uh, uh, in chapter two, I take a critical de review of the th uh, develop historical development of the theory of comparative advantage. In chapter three, I develop a general equilibrium with individual heterogeneity of comparative advantage. In chapter four, I upgrade that model to, uh, to include spatial heterogeneity and externalities. In chapter five, I uh, discuss some implications of relaxing the implicit assumption of complete information. And uh, in chapter six, I assess some previously uh, suggested indicators, uh, provide some empirics of environmental externalities in the Canadian dairy industry, and some techniques for overbased quota allocation to uh, provinces based on quota prices. Now, I won't talk about all this uh, now. Uh, I will touch upon uh, some of the conclusions of chapter two, I will focus on chapter four and parts of chapter six. So after assessing the literature on comparative advantage, what I found is that most of the literature uses aggregate models, uh, which explicitly or implicitly assume homogeneous inputs within an economy. Homogeneous outputs often tie uh, aggregate production functions aggregate production functions, which lead to, uh, again, a, an implicit assumption of individual uh, homogeneity uh, within an economy. Uh, oftentimes, also complete knowledge or information assumption is involved. Now, there are some implications uh, stemming from this, uh, and basically, uh, these models are uh, not very useful for understanding the link between comparative advantage institutions and individual heterogeneity. Uh, and since one of our questions, research questions, deals with observing uh, uh, underlying economic characteristics of individuals uh, within a specific institutional system, namely supply management, and then uh, another question deals with uh, explaining some uh, observations that are at a fairly disaggregated level, I found appropriate to develop uh, an individual level of comparative advantage, individual uh, of, uh, also based on individual comparative advantage. Uh, so what I do, I develop a general equilibrium with individual spatial heterogeneity uh, and externalities model of comparative advantage. And now I'll present some of the features of that model. 
Uh, we have three outputs. We have polluting food, non-polluting food.